Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher's history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher's history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, welcome to A Teacher's History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that President Thomas Jefferson knew the French plan for trying to create a French empire in the Americas, but more or less called Napoleon's bluff, not taking any action to prepare for such a circumstance? And that Robert Livingston agreed to purchase Louisiana, effectively doubling the size of the United States without getting approval from anyone. And that the purchase of Louisiana may have given Thomas Jefferson the opportunity to take even bolder action in limiting the expansion of slavery into the future, something that he chose not to do. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 94. The Louisiana Purchase. All right, everyone, welcome into episode 94. Apologies for not having an episode last week. If you follow the Facebook page or follow me on Twitter, you may have seen that Apple temporarily deleted the podcast off of iTunes. Apparently, there were some issues with the new artwork and uh, a couple other things I had to clean up from uh, back in 2017 when I first launched it. They've updated some of their policies. So now we are good to go. Um, if you were wondering last week where the episode was and you don't follow me uh, or us, I should say, on Facebook or follow me on Twitter, um, I'd recommend that just so you know I can communicate with you if there are any updates to the pod that you may want or need to know about. And the Facebook page is just A Teacher's History of the United States. On Twitter, I'm at a teacher's hist. Book recommendation for today is A Wilderness So Immense, The Louisiana Purchase and the Destiny of America by John Kukla. Um, I hope I pronounced his last name correctly, uh, K-U-K-L-A. It is a really good account of the story of the Louisiana Purchase, includes 20 years of history, goes into great depth on all the most important players and really fascinating stuff. I recommend you check it out. I'll be putting it up on the book recommendations on the website, and I'll be putting a link up on Facebook and Twitter for it. Um, the past few weeks, I've met up with two different listeners, John in Philadelphia, uh, who gave me the lowdown on some of the neighborhoods in Philadelphia and a great dinner recommendation. And John, it was great to uh, meet up with you and grab some beers and learn more about you and uh, Philly. And then a loyal listener and loyal patron, Norm. He was on his way through Baltimore. Uh, he toured Gettysburg and was heading down to D.C., stopped in Baltimore for a day for Fort McHenry and Camden Yards, and we met up for lunch, and it was awesome to meet him too. So if you're in the area, Baltimore area, let me know. I'd be more than happy to meet up with you, and if uh, I travel in the future, I'll let you know. Um, last update before we dive into it, episode 100, uh, Per popular demand will be another Q&A with Zach, Bill, and myself. So if you have questions about uh, history, podcasting, us, um, just shoot them over to chris at a teacher's history dot com. Uh, you can email it or you can reach out on Twitter or Facebook and we'll be sure to get those questions answered for you for the 100th episode. Last week, Bill and I dove deeper into the Supreme Court case of Marbury v. Madison and discussed the establishment of judicial review and how it's impacted American history and American government and politics. I, hopefully, that episode was valuable for some of you and you enjoyed learning more about such an important and I, I honestly think often overlooked Supreme Court decision. 
This week, we're going to continue with our narrative of Thomas Jefferson's presidency, and we'll be looking specifically at Jefferson's greatest foreign diplomacy achievement, and arguably the greatest in American history, the purchase of the Louisiana Territory. The purchase of Louisiana for only $15 million was truly an incredible accomplishment by President Jefferson and dramatically changed the makeup and future of the United States of America. The story is a pretty fascinating one, so let's dive right into it. As I mentioned briefly in episode 92, when introducing Lewis and Clark's expedition, Thomas Jefferson was a man who was pretty enamored by the idea of westward expansion and tapping into the vast resources of the western lands on the continent. Only a few months after taking office, Thomas Jefferson was committed to this idea, telling James Monroe that, quote, it is impossible not to look forward to distant times when our rapid multiplication will cover the whole northern, if not the southern continent, with a people speaking the same language, governed in similar forms, and by similar laws. At the time that Jefferson took office, he was aware that there were likely approximately half a million Americans already living west of the Allegheny Mountains, and he wanted there to be considerably more. He thought the natural migration of American settlers was going to be the best way for America to expand. No need to have formal government interference or conquering armies. Just let the people move west, and the rest will take care of itself. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is that when Jefferson entered the presidency, it seemed, at least on the surface, that the Spanish Empire was going to be dominating the continent for years to come. If you were to just look at it on paper, and my students would often do this when we look at maps of the United States of America in the late 18, uh, very early 1900s, Spain seemed to be a massive player in the Western Hemisphere, technically maintaining control or at least claiming possession of all of the land around the Gulf of Mexico, all of the land west of the Mississippi, all the way to the Pacific, Mexico, and South America. I mean, this was an enormous amount of land, and the Spanish presence in what is present-day United States, you would think, would make Jefferson a bit uneasy. but. That may be for a different reason than you're assuming. See, while it looked like Spain was in control of this enormous empire, those in the know, so to speak, men who were plugged into international politics, such as President Jefferson, knew that the Spanish had been slowly in a steady decline. And actually, I guess I shouldn't give them too much credit. Most everyone knew that. Ever since the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, With that in mind, Jefferson's primary concern wasn't that Spain controlled this huge empire and would be impossible to deal with, but in fact, it was the opposite. Jefferson wanted to make sure Spain was able to hold on to the empire long enough for America to come along and take it from them piecemeal. But as you know, or hopefully you remembered from a few weeks ago when I mentioned it in episode 92, the Spanish were not going to be in control of all this land for much longer. So, It didn't take long for Jefferson's dreams of ripping this land from Spain to begin to fade. Only months after he took office in the White House, Jefferson was receiving a steady supply of rumors that the Spanish had reigned on Jefferson's imagined parade, selling half of their land in the Western Hemisphere to Napoleon and the French, replacing, for all practical purposes, the weakest Western European nation with, yep, the strongest. And to make matters worse, there were additional rumors that Napoleon had legit intentions to turn his new purchase into a French empire in the Western Hemisphere, not exactly the news that Thomas Jefferson was hoping to hear. But by the spring of 1803, the rumors of this, quote, secret treaty had become, well, almost comical. At least the French continuing to deny it was almost comical. It was likely the worst kept secret in all of Europe. Jefferson had been biding his time to take any real action on these western lands for almost two years, but by now, in 1803, he was growing a bit impatient. He knew that the treaty was real, and now it was time to deal with Napoleon and the French if he wanted any real opportunity to expand the American Empire West, and he needed to take action. 
Because if the French really did control this area, well, he needed to know 100% for sure because that is a big deal. Thomas Jefferson found himself acting as his own Secretary of State, a position he had experience in, and began to imagine how potential negotiations with France would have to be handled. Because the biggest problem was the port of New Orleans, and Jefferson knew it, lamenting that, quote, there is on the globe one single spot, the possessor of which is our natural and habitual enemy. It is New Orleans. And as we have mentioned before, France controlling this port was far more threatening to the United States than Spain being in possession of it. And what made Jefferson's stance on this somewhat surprising, if not shocking, was that he knew that this meant, for all intents and purposes, if the rumor was true, he was going to have to shed his long-standing personal love and allegiance to the French. He even observed that, quote, from that moment, we must marry ourselves to the British fleet and nation. With this in mind, Jefferson began to enter into back-channel politics. He'd arrived at the conclusion that while the French were massively wealthier and more capable on the battlefield than the United States, it was the Atlantic Ocean and the incredible vastness of the United States that made entering into war against us so difficult. And we had the American Revolution to prove it. Thomas Jefferson was in communication with a prominent French aristocrat, Samuel Dupont, and the American minister in Paris, Robert Livingston. He explained to both of them to communicate the message to those in Paris that needed to hear it, that as long as France is in control of New Orleans, they would be an enemy of the United States. With this in mind, Jefferson was willing to make a deal. If France gave the United States the port of New Orleans and West Florida, then Jefferson was prepared to pay them $6 million. On top of this, if the French were willing to accept this, the U.S. would begrudgingly allow them to continue to occupy all the land west of the Mississippi. While this may, at least at first blush, seem like a pretty big concession for the United States and possibly even short-sighted, Jefferson knew exactly what he was doing, or at least he thought he did. He was playing the long game. He figured that if he was able to get New Orleans and Western Florida and bide his time, American settlers would continue flooding west, all the way up to the shores on the eastern bank of the Mississippi, making French possession of all the land on the western side of the river untenable. And I think it is important to take a moment to mention to you why Jefferson was so obsessed with New Orleans, because, I mean, Mardi Gras parades didn't even exist yet. The Port of New Orleans connected the Gulf of Mexico to the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River was likely the most valuable body of water in the United States at this time. The Gulf of Mexico connects to the Mississippi, which connects to the Great Lakes, which eventually connects to the Atlantic Ocean. If the Americans were able to gain access to the Mississippi via the Port of New Orleans, shipping and trade into the interior of the nation would be so much easier and more profitable further driving westward expansion and economic growth. With his directions in hand from the president, Livingston went to work. He was able to confirm that rumors of the, quote, secret treaty between Spain and France were, in fact, true. Not only that, but Talleyrand, the French minister of foreign affairs, a man that we met when we talked about the XYZ affair under Adams' presidency, had big visions for this land. His plan was to use the Louisiana Territory as a place that the French could send their debtors and criminals, similar to what Britain did with Australia. These unwanted French citizens would then populate the vast territory, and it could be used as a way to supply the French islands in the Caribbean with goods. Speaking of the Caribbean, the next part of this grand plan was to send about 25,000 French troops to Santo Domingo to put down a slave uprising. After that was accomplished, they would then head to the port of New Orleans, plant their flag, and announce their presence in North America, all without the U.S. expecting it. So, to recap, Talleyrand thinks that he's going to create a French empire in this land called Louisiana. But before he does that, he has to put down the Haitian Revolution. 
After he does that, he wants you to fail on over to New Orleans and then lay claim to the French Empire. Seemed pretty simple. But, of course, the entire plan hinged on this secret treaty, you know, actually being secret, which at this point, it was clear to everyone that it was not. When Jefferson heard about this plan, with about two months to go before the French were even going to set sail, he wasn't the least bit concerned, or at least he didn't act concerned. He took a gamble that the suppression of the rebellion in Santo Domingo was going to be a lot more difficult than Talleyrand expected. And the odds were that they would not be planting any flags in New Orleans anytime soon. In order to make sure that something did happen, and that it happened soon though, Thomas Jefferson sent his boy, James Monroe, to join Livingston in Paris. And since Monroe was a former ambassador to France, he was pretty comfortable, at least uh, formally, with this assignment. He did personally have a few reservations and didn't really want to be given this much responsibility, but he did what was best for Jefferson and for the nation. And by the way, just as an aside, we'll dive deeper into Monroe, but he idolized Thomas Jefferson, and uh, they were very, very close. Monroe was given full reign to negotiate with Talleyrand and to bring back good news. It was at this point that the Americans proved to the French that they were far more adept at international politics than maybe the French had assumed. It was at this point that Livingston began to leak news of the secret treaty throughout France and even into other parts of Europe. He then openly questioned why France would try to pull off a stunt like this, seeing as it would only force the United States into the arms of France's primary enemy, England. To put even more pressure on Paris, while whispers were going on in Europe what France was thinking alienating the United States, it then leaked out that Monroe was being sent to come to some type of agreement on the issue in Paris. And if he was unable to do so, he was instructed to sail across the channel and into the arms of what would be the U.S.'s next great ally, the British. And while one would think that this type of leverage would really put Monroe and Livingston in a good spot, it didn't. At least, not yet. Talleyrand was delusional about this idea of a French empire in America and actually was still standing firm to the fiction that no such treaty existed between the French and the Spanish. Meanwhile, Livingston noted that, in the end, it was all up to Napoleon anyway. Because he was the de facto emperor of France, a title that he's actually going to be given about a year from now. So until something were to happen that would make Napoleon see the light, all of this politicking was falling on deaf ears. And that brings us to the event that helped Napoleon see the light, the Caribbean. French General Charles Leclerc was given very specific instructions. He was to take his 25 men to Santo Domingo, which is, uh, by the way, present-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And he was to execute a ruse that would convince the leader of the revolution, Toussaint Louverture, that he was sympathetic to their cause. Then, when the time was right, he was to butcher and maim all of those participating in the slave insurrection. He was to provide quarter or relief to none of them. In fact, Napoleon wanted to send such a strong message that his instructions were brutal and shameful. He wanted to send bloodhounds from Jamaica to track down any men or women or children that tried to flee. He gave instructions to decapitate, drown, or burn alive any that resisted. And in case that wasn't enough, he even toyed with the idea of sticking gunpowder up their rectum of some of the men and exploding it. Then, Napoleon's plans were for Leclerc to force all of them back into slavery and head with his men over to New Orleans while backup was on its way, sailing from Paris. At least, this was the plan. And at first, it seemed to be working out okay, as Toussaint, the leader of this slave rebellion, was captured and shipped back to Europe, where he died in prison. But before he left, 
Toussaint warned Leclerc that he was greatly misjudging his chances, and he was in for a rude awakening. And he was. At the highest point, the French had 40,000 men in Santa Domingo, and they were up against about 500,000 black rebels. Those odds are impossible to overcome. I don't care how good of soldiers you are. And when the rebels found out that the ultimate goal was to re-enslave them, well, they began to fight and act with reckless abandon. They were sacrificing their lives for the cause and refusing to ever go back to slavery. Over time, the rebels, malaria, and yellow fever all joined together to ruin any French chances of regaining the colony. On his deathbed, General Leclerc wrote a letter to Napoleon updating him on the unfortunate situation, explaining that, quote, this colony is lost and you will never regain it. My letter will surprise you, but what general could not calculate on the mortality of four-fifths of his army? When word of the Haitian disaster that cost the lives of about 60,000 French men reached Paris, Napoleon was beside himself. Since he had one eye on America and the other on England, it was now time for him to give up his Louisiana pipe dream and focus on his chief European rival, England. Napoleon declared that he was willing to sell all of Louisiana, and in April of 1803, he stated, quote, I renounce Louisiana. It is not only New Orleans that I will cede. It is the whole colony without any reservation. I know the price of what I abandon. I renounce it with the greatest regret. But to attempt to obstinately to retain it would be folly. Napoleon then brushed aside visions of rising American empire and said that he was willing to sell all of Louisiana for about $12.5 million. In true entrepreneurial fashion, Livingston recognized the opportunity in front of him and jumped on it. He figured he could figure out the people and the price later. Monroe was still days away, and Livingston was not going to let this opportunity pass him by. He agreed to the purchase of the land, and once Monroe arrived in Paris, he informed him as much. The only thing that really needed to be negotiated was the price. And on May 5th, 1803, both sides agreed to the purchase of Louisiana for $15 million, and both sides were pretty happy. Word reached the U.S. on July 3rd, 1803, and Americans all throughout the nation were astonished and shocked at the news, celebrating Independence Day with added enthusiasm. But now that America had purchased the land, the next challenge was to figure out what exactly they purchased. As mentioned in episode 92, Jefferson had hired Meriwether Lewis to explore the territory and report back a waterway to the Pacific. While Lewis and Clark were exploring, Jefferson sat down to figure out exactly where the heck the boundaries of Louisiana exactly were. I mean, what exactly did the French buy from the Spanish that we just bought from the French? And the French were no help because, honestly, they didn't care. They just wanted their 15 million bucks to keep fighting their war in Europe. By Jefferson's interpretation, though, he had just purchased the territory that stretched all the way from West Florida and included all of present-day Texas. Naturally, the Spanish were a bit flummoxed and said that in the end, it didn't really matter because the sale was illegal. Talleyrand and Napoleon had promised them that they would not sell it to another country. Madison likely laughed and told them that, you know, yeah, we don't care. They lied to you. Sorry. While Jefferson believed that the purchase did include West Florida and present-day Texas, he wasn't really going to press the issue. It was clear that Spain was an empire in steep decline. It was just, quote, a matter of time until it was all theirs. But back at home, not everyone loved the Louisiana Purchase. The irony was too much to ignore. Small government Thomas Jefferson 
the same man who often called the Federalist monarchist, had just pulled off the boldest executive action in the short history of the United States and one of, if not the boldest executive action in the entire history of the United States. What a hypocrite. And this was not lost on Jefferson. He was haunted by the idea that while he could probably justify this under his treaty-making authority, just like the Federalists did with the Jay Treaty, in the end, it was imperative to the future of the political institutions of the United States that limited executive authority remained intact. He knew that this action flew in the face of his political creed, and he did not want to set this precedent for executive authority of the president moving forward. So, in order to do this, Jefferson painstakingly began drafting a constitutional amendment that would allow the purchase of Louisiana. One of the real questions was whether or not a vote on the amendment or the actual purchase should come first. But Albert Gallatin, the Secretary of Treasury, argued that this was an unnecessary precaution. Plus, the time it would take for an amendment to pass may even threaten the sale itself. But Jefferson stood firm, at least initially. That is how it needed to happen. He refused to be the one responsible for single-handedly expanding executive authority to this level. But just if Jefferson was planning on rolling out the amendment that would have included votes by Congress and the states, which would have effectively no longer rendered this just an executive action but a collective action, he received word from Livingston that Napoleon was starting to get a little anxious and was having second thoughts about this whole Louisiana purchase and that Jefferson needed to get this wrapped up ASAP before they lose the entire thing. It was at this point that Jefferson again acted quickly, telling Madison to never mention their talk about this whole amendment thing and to draft the treaty and have Congress vote on it. Because in the end, quote, to lose our country by a scrupulous adherence to written laws would be to lose the law itself. In an unfolding of events that certainly surprised no one, the Federalists argued against the purchase, using the exact same arguments the Republicans had used against them with regards to the Jay Treaty and the Bank of the United States. And of course, the Republicans now flip-flopped and started bringing up the necessary and proper clause to justify it, which is the exact same clause that the Federalists used to justify the bank that the Republicans hated so much. It's pretty incredible stuff that really reinforces this idea that arguments in politics shift from one side to another, depending on who is in power. And in a lot of ways, not much has changed in the last couple hundred years in American politics. The next question to be answered was, what were they going to do with all this new territory? Who was going to govern it? How was it to be governed? What about all the native tribes? How will they divide the land? And what may surprise many, Congress pretty much wanted nothing to do with the laborious task of answering all these questions. And in a move that likely made Jefferson very uncomfortable, they abdicated and deferred all responsibility for it and gave it to him. So Jefferson then sat down and tried to secretly write out a constitution for Louisiana, which in essence made Louisiana an American colony which flies in the face of the Republican principles of our nation. There's just hypocrisy all around recently in these episodes. But look, Jefferson had his reasons, as misguided as they may have been. He once mentioned that, quote, our new fellow citizens are yet as incapable of self-government as children. Why did Jefferson have such a limited view of the potential of these inhabitants in the Louisiana Territory, especially considering that he often had a lot of faith in the common American? Well, considering that in Article 3 of the treaty, where it said all inhabitants of the land will become U.S. citizens, Jefferson changed it to all white inhabitants. And using that small little adjustment, it may just give us our answer to his perspective. See, much of this land that America had just purchased, including the port city of New Orleans, was made up of Creole character, people who were mixed, Spanish, French, African, 
and Native American blood. While this certainly doesn't make Jefferson look very good, especially with 21st century sensibilities, it isn't really all that surprising either. This conversation could then really open up a can of worms with Jefferson, as many historians believe that in some ways he viewed this Louisiana Purchase as an opportunity to find ways to relocate Native Americans, an eerily reminiscent approach to that of Andrew Jackson 26 years later. In fact, Jefferson openly tossed around this idea of, quote, Indian exchange, in conversation and in letters, envisioning an America in which the land east of the Mississippi would be dominated by white Americans, with natives happily moving west, as they would be, quote, glad to feed us their country here for an equivalent there. This observation makes it clear and undeniable that, in fact, the Louisiana Purchase was an incredible diplomatic victory for the United States of America, and allowed us to vault to the top of the world stage, while at the same time created a physical environment to help expel the natives west of the Mississippi, just like men like Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, and others desired. With this, I think it also makes sense to look at this purchase and consider its impact on the expansion of slavery. Maybe even consider, what if? Now, Often, if a fan of American history, it is difficult for me to see people speak of men and women in our history as though they lived and were exposed to the culture of the late 20th and 21st centuries. Attempting to reconcile our progressive views on race relations and gender with those of our forefathers is very difficult. That does not mean we don't need to attempt to hold ourselves and our future generations to higher standards because we do. But at times, I think people lose social context when they have discussions about these people in a vacuum. That being said, to say Thomas Jefferson was pretty outspokenly anti-slavery is an accurate statement. And what might seem a bit Odd, considering the reality that he owned slaves, then had a relationship with one, and vehemently denied it based on his insecurity of that relationship, Thomas Jefferson, it seems, really did not like the idea of slavery. He thought it was a stain on our Republican principles. He had proposed a bill in the Confederation Congress to outlaw slavery in all American territories, and we will see as he grows older that he continued to rail against slavery as it became an increasingly contentious issue in American politics. So while it was clear that Thomas Jefferson thought more highly of white Americans than those of other races, slavery, at least in his writings and words, he was politically against. And I know the counter-argument his actions speak louder than words. I get it. I'm not ignoring that. And that brings us to the biggest what if of the Louisiana Purchase that I would often bring up in class when I taught this. What if Jefferson had done something similar to what he did when he was on the Confederation Congress? What if he had proposed a way to prevent slavery from being legal in this new territory? Certainly, if he had, it would have progressed the abolition of slavery, since it would have greatly limited its expansion and thrown the slave states into an immediate path to a minority voice in both houses of government. Now, look, a lot would have also had to be put in place, such as new states admitted, couldn't have slavery, and potentially the federal government devised a way to compensate slave owners for manumission, but nonetheless, something to consider. With this in mind, the next question is why Jefferson did not take steps to do it. Why did he not act to ban slavery in this territory? Well, first off, the Federalists were not really pushing for it. In fact, those in New England were too busy clamoring about their own secession plans, something we'll talk about in more detail in a future episode, which they will attempt about 15 years later. On top of this, if there's one thing we know about Thomas Jefferson, it's that he knew talk of slavery publicly would only continue to divide the nation, and that he likely wanted to do, do everything he could to avoid it. And we see this about 15 years later in the Missouri Compromise, when Jefferson famously lamented how the topic of slavery in the Missouri Territory had become a national argument, describing the relationship between the U.S. and slavery by quipping, quote, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. As you pack up your things, I would like you to consider and take a moment to appreciate the incredible story of the Louisiana Purchase. 
if it wasn't for an obstinate and courageous population in Santo Domingo and the temperamental decision-making by Napoleon, along with the diplomacy of Livingston and Monroe, of course, we would not have had the opportunity for such bold action. Frederick Jackson Turner, one of the foremost historians of Western American history, declared that, quote, having taken the decisive stride across the Mississippi, the United States enlarged the horizon of her views and marched steadily forward to the possession of the Pacific Ocean. From this event dates the rise of the United States into a position of world power. In the end, the U.S. bought Louisiana for a cool $15 million, which equates to only $260 million today, which, in case you need reminding, is an incredible deal. The U.S. doubled in size, gaining land from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and to the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border. For only four cents an acre, Thomas Jefferson was able to open up vast opportunities for this burgeoning nation and was somehow able to make the purchase of Manhattan for $24 not look all that impressive in the process. Politically, this was arguably the boldest executive action in American history, rivaled only by Truman's decision to drop the atomic bomb in 1945. This story also included our current president, our next two presidents, Madison and Monroe, Talleyrand, Napoleon, and Toussaint Louverture. The events that had come together almost perfectly to make this happen were impossible to predict and likely never replicated. I think Alexander Hamilton said it best, even though we know he was a biased observer, when he noted that, quote, every man possessed of the latest candor and reflection will readily acknowledge that the acquisition has been solely owing to the fortuitous concurrence of unforeseen and unexpected circumstances, not to any wise or vigorous measures on part of the American government. Thanks for listening. And hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.